Rose, the OJHL Commissioner, Marty Savoy. And Marty, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Talking to you before the interview, you said you have three kids home, homeschooling. So trying to homeschool and uh, juggle a league and try to figure out uh, answers as to how this league will continue on. But before we get into that, go back to us, Marty, uh, back to Monday when you heard the news that uh, the province was going into a pause. But I guess more more importantly, when you heard the news that the OJHL wasn't going to be included in the list of either high performance league or not being considered high performance athletes. To be honest with you, Mark, the very first thing I thought about was, you know, the, the 506 kids that play in our league that are trying to move on to the next level. And, you know, it, it, what they do day in and day out, um, we consider them elite athletes. Um, they, they, everything they do in their lives from working out um, to what they eat, how they prepare, their schooling, everything they do is sort of to move on within the game and whatnot. And so uh, we felt for them, it's, you know, a third year in a row almost for some of these players that have to take a pause here. Um, and so the very first thing we thought of is, is, is obviously we jump on a call as staff and how can we be prepared to get this thing back on rails for these kids. Marty, leading up to this, and obviously you've had discussions with the government in the past about this league and maybe possibly being able to play uh, somehow without uh, while the restrictions in place. How frustrating it is to consider that these kids aren't high performance athletes or this league isn't high performance, uh, a high performance league, considering the fact that a lot of these kids make the choices to play in this league because they're looking to south of the border for, uh, you know, NCAA scholarships. And we've seen many kids come out of this league and all of the uh, all of the four leagues in Ontario go the NCAA route where, you know, they can't go to the OHL because they're no longer eligible to go to the NCAA route. route. Yeah, you know, when, when you, I don't know the rationale that goes behind the, the, the provincial government's decision on elite. Um, I think you look at something like youth sports um, are considered elite as well. Um, so I don't know the basis of how they make that decisions on it. Um, you know, we look at our league and we have, you know, we always have a half a dozen or, or, or so players on the NHL watch list that get drafted. So it affects those of them as well. You know, when you look at the NCAA scholarship, just the, the, the money alone that these players are competing for, you're looking in the millions of dollars of scholarship money every year that comes out of the, of the league that, that most afford. So it is a bit frustrating. I can appreciate the, the pressure that the provincial government is under and the, the minister of sport. Um, I, I just wish that they could look and take another look at it um, to see to try to get us back and playing within three weeks. Uh, it is just a three week pause for us. Um, but it's still, it's the frustrating part. It's not, not for us as staff and coaches. And then we do this to help the kids out. It's just these kids now take a three week pause and they, they can't train. Um, and it takes these athletes a bit to get back into it. So that's our biggest our, our concern right now. Is there lobbying continuing right now, Marty, uh, as uh, you know, we're in the first day of the restrictions that are put in place where, th where we're in for the next three weeks with the, uh, with the Ontario government to try to sway them to allow this league to start back up maybe before the uh, 21 days are up? Yeah, I have a call this morning with the, the Ontario Hockey Association to see what we can move through on this side. Uh, to move things and decisions in three weeks is going to be pretty tough. Uh, again, I can appreciate that the provincial government has a lot on their plate um, to make decisions and whatnot. But we, Mark, you, you know us, we do what we can, whatever we can for these players. And uh, if we have to fight up until the day before the, the, the pauses, we will. We'll do anything we can to get these kids back and playing right now. Late yesterday afternoon, Marty, the league put out a, a statement, uh, and I want to quote it uh, so we can continue on here. It says, the OJHL is committed to a full OJHL regular season and playoff schedule for 2021-22 season, and we have put together various operational scenarios to allow us to do, though, to do so. You continue on with, with the current mandated pause, the OJHL has multiple scenarios developed which will allow us to get a full season and playoff in this season. Can you expand on that for us and what we're looking at? Because, you know, my quick estimate of, of adding games up, I think there's like 79 games are going to be canceled between uh, the 5th and the 27th. The handful or so be before that to, uh, you know, in late December, early January that were canceled as well. So, you know, it's a pretty tight time frame from the time the season ends to when the playoffs begin. So can you expand on what thoughts or what might be happening here uh, once the restrictions are lifted? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. So what what we're looking at right now is the number of games. And I think we're looking at about 90 games that we're going to have to get scheduled in. 
Um, and we don't look at it as the 90 games. We look at it how many per team. Um, and so anywhere between seven to, I think it's 13 games, we're going to have to get rescheduled. Uh, we have a conference call with our general managers tonight. Um, and I know the stress and pressure they're under. Uh, they deal with these kids each and every day. Um, and what we're going to be asking of them is to try to get as many of these games in before the end of our schedule here at the beginning of March. We already have a pretty condensed schedule because we started three weeks late, three to four weeks late this season. Uh, we play every night going into the rest of the season. We don't have a night off, um, but we're going to try to get as many games in as possible. If we have to, we will extend the end of the season to get it in. Um, and then it's just time market. So what we're going to be looking at is that do we do the first round best of fives and then the second round best of sevens? Um, so I think right now we have, I think there's 19 scenarios due to time of what that would look like. Um, but we are committed to make sure that we get the full season in, the 54 game season for the players, uh, and then get some type of playoffs that we have to get in once we know how much time we have. Wow. 19 scenarios, Marty. Like that's a, you must have everything possibly covered in, you know, probably when you do the 19 scenarios and you have a GM call tonight, you're probably, you'll probably get a couple of more that uh, maybe you haven't thought of as well. The great thing about this sport, Mark, is that there's a lot of educated people when it talks to doing scheduling. Not we have, you know, there's one double elimination type thing we can do if we only have 14 days left and everything. Is that putting the actual plans together aren't as difficult. We have unbelievable staff and Ruben Cohen, Rick Morocco, and Chris Fanstone that helped me put all this stuff together. And once we know the time that we have to deliver it, then we can enact the plan that we have to put in place. The number one goal we have is to get our season done. We're extremely confident we're going to get it in. Uh, we believe that, you know, the time that we have permitted to be able to do it, it might be a little condensed, uh, but remember in our playoffs, our kids are going every other night anyways right now. So uh, we're pretty confident we're going to get the full season in. When the, when the restrictions lift, Marty, on January 27th, uh, I do believe there's game scheduled the next night uh, in the league. Do you see those going first, forth on the 28th, or will you be looking at a possible three or four day training camp, or is that still up for discussion, considering that some of these kids might be off the ice for over a month and a half, depending on when their Christmas season broke? Uh, you know, they might have had a couple of practices, but obviously, you know, they can't work out like they usually do with the gym closed now. There's no ice time unless, you know, if someone has an outdoor rink that they all can gather at and play. But uh, it's certainly, I know you always think of safety first for these individuals, for these players. So uh, has that been discussed at all that maybe a, a little training camp to get these kids back on the ice and get legs underneath them once again so they're to avoid injuries? Yeah, so right now I believe we have the three games on the first night we can open up and we'll be discussing that with our, with our general managers tonight of how much of a runway they require. Uh, Mark, unfortunately, the good thing out of all this is some of these players are used to training at home um, because of what they've had to go through for the last three years here, two and a half years. Um, and so we'll work with the teams individually one on one to discuss where they are with their athlete. Um, if they need an extra day to do it, we'll, we'll accommodate that, knowing that every day that we push back or more games that we have to get inside the schedule. But <clears throat> we will be doing it kind of based off each individual team where they think their athlete is at. Marty, if when the league gets back to starting again on the on the 28th and uh, uh, and the government still has some restrictions in place where maybe possibly no fans in the arena for these games, do the owners have an appetite to continue on with this league? If obviously there's no fans in, in the arenas, uh, you know, obviously that's going to be some lost revenues for some owners. You know, we look at Trenton, who usually draws big Wellington, other communities as well. Yeah, Mark, I, I have to tell you, our, our 22 governors have been unbelievable throughout this process. Um, they, they've been very clear to me in the direction they've given me is that they want the players to play. Um, they can make it up in other years if they have to. So if there's no fans, we, we, we will continue to play. Our current protocols we have in place probably go above and beyond most leagues. We have double screening that they have to do before they come to the rink. Um, we have, you know, ATs that check them out all the time. We have signs posted. We have sanitization things. We bought every team a defogger. They have to defog their rooms. Um, so we know our protocols are good enough. Uh, when we shut down games, um, you know, if, if there was one positive test, we would shut down a game. Um, so we know the protocols are there in place. If there's no fans, our governors want us to move forward and make sure the kids can play. Marty, historically, this league has ran on uh, uh, four teams each or eight teams each division. It's a, a four game series to have to get out to to proceed to the Dudley Hewitt Cup. Um, will the playoff format continue the same as it is right now with the same number of teams that will make the playoffs as in previous years? 
Yeah. So every plan that we do have has the, you know, the top four teams in each division moving forward. Um, we, we won't, because uh, Martin, I think you appreciate that if, if you've ever been with a hockey team, especially a junior team, is that they look at the schedule and the standings every day. Um, and so we don't want to take that away. Um, remember, it's the experience that we're really worried about with our players right now. That's why our mental health program, our first assist program through the foundation is getting more online with them right now. So we want to make sure we keep it as normal as possible. So every plan we have right now has all 16 teams that would qualify for playoffs in a regular year will be playing playoffs. That's a tight schedule if you continue on with what you've done previously, Marty, where it's the 7-7-7-7 uh, seven, uh, seven, 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 seven game series all the way through because you know, historically, you're going to need about eight weeks to run that. You usually sustain about two weeks per uh, series uh, with a couple of days let, uh, in between, which leads you right up pretty tight to the start of the Dudley Hewitt on May 10th in Red Lake. Yeah, and, and so that's exactly what we're looking at, Mark. So if depending on time that we have to find is that we would reduce it to a five-game uh, series or even a three-game series if we have to do that. Um, knowing that the championship series, we want to try to keep as possible as a seven game true series. Um, you know, we just announced a new partnership with Nutra Farms the first year um, to have a sponsor for the program. So we're trying to keep that as, as, as tight as possible with the seven games. And once we know what we're looking at time wise, we'll be able to make those decisions and we'll be announcing it as soon as we know. With the playoff format, Marty, uh, in the past with the off, uh, off balance uh, uh, standings or teams in each it, Sometimes the fourth place team in one division will play the, or the fifth place team in the division will play the fourth in the other side, depending on the, the point variation. Will that continue this year? Yep, absolutely. So if there's the, just make sure I get this right. If there's six teams in one and five in the other division and five division, um, fourth place team has less points than the one in the sixth division, uh, they play a, a, a game. As well as we have to keep the one day afterwards is because in our league, if you tie for the last playoff spot, regardless of wins or anything, you have to play a, a playoff round to get a game to get in there. Um, so we have to schedule that one day of possibility. I, I know one year we had both of them and it's we get back to the exciting hockey mark. We get to watch all those games. And um, so we're I don't want to say we're hoping for it. I know the teams aren't. But um, yes, we still have that in place. And the reason I ask that, because, you know, you see the Lindsay Muskies this year who have completely turned that operation around. And, uh, you know, currently them and Colbert are fighting for the fourth and fifth spot in that division. You look on the other side, not as strong on the other side who they would play. So, uh, you know, it'd be a shame for, uh, you know, if, you know, whoever was in that spot, they didn't get that opportunity this year uh, going forward. So with the compressed schedule, uh, you know, are the man are uh, general managers or hockey operations people that run these teams now looking at their communities, finding out when they can possibly get more or more ice time to possibly have the schedule games within the week now. Yeah, exactly. Um, some of them already have because when we had to, you know, postpone some of the games because of our protocols here. They've already been trying to do that. Um, and that's the direction we're going to go through with them tonight. Um, again, these guys are so committed to these teams. They've already been reaching out. When we say our phones are ringing off the hook, they actually, they are because they want to know, okay, can I start rescheduling? Can I get these games in for the kids? So that's what we're going to be outlining tonight to get. But again, ice time is at a premium and trying to get these games in where we don't want to be putting too much stress on them for within the games. Um, so it's just, it, there's no perfect formula to all of this, um, but they will be trying to reschedule as many as we can before the, before the end of the natural uh, season. Final question, Marty, what do you say to the fans of this league that, uh, you know, have uh, came back uh, in droves, have supported this league uh, throughout this, uh, you know, when the season start, many were wondering uh, if the fans would come back and they certainly have. What's your message to the fans of all across the OJHL? You know, Mark, it's a great question. I think the biggest thing is thank you. Um, you know, unfortunately, when I go into the rinks, a lot of them do come up and talk to me. Um, I know Coburg down there have one, probably the biggest OJ fan and Nick Scar. Um, but uh, I, I just want to thank them. You know, they, they, it's not the league that they back. It's not the league that they follow. It's not even sometimes the teams that they follow. It's these kids that they support. And you see that when there's a player like a, a Zach Hyman that goes to the National Hockey League and everybody's so excited because they know that kid when he came through. And I just, just want to thank the fans for continuing to support. Again, not the league, but the kids themselves.